Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is the first of a two-part conversation on the Middle East. Iraq, Iran, withdrawal or persistence, containment or detente, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and oil. Joining me once again to talk about the Middle East, its problems and prospects, and U.S. policy in the region is a distinguished Middle East hand, Richard Murphy, former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Syria, the Philippines, and Mauritania. He has served as U.S. Secretary of State for Near Eastern and Asian Affairs and has been named career U.S. ambassador. He was a senior fellow for the Middle East at the Council on Foreign Relations for 15 years. And Ambassador Murphy is a frequent TV commentator and widely consulted expert. Welcome back, Mr. Ambassador. Very good to be here. For my fall semester graduate seminar in Middle East politics and international relations. We talked last time in February, the end of February, and the Annapolis summit had just finished. Turkish troops had crossed the border into Iraq. Bush and Rice were in the Middle East begging oil from the Saudis, and Iran was challenging U.S. warships in the Gulf of Hormuz. It seems to have gotten quieter. It seems to be cooler. Is, is that the case? Well, uh, it certainly looked explosive uh, uh, then, and yet today, if it's quieter, can, that can be deceptive. Okay. None of the issues you're talking about have been satisfactorily resolved either to our, uh, from our point of view, or from the players in the region. So it, things are still happening, they just aren't very clear what yeah. these things are. But uh, it, there seems to be some change in direction, I think. Uh, the Bush approach to the Middle East looks a little bit different, more engagement and less unilateralism. Syria seems to sort of be breaking out of its isolation. Lebanon's got a new government. Are the appearances deceiving? Before we take a sort of a country-by-country -country tour in this discussion and next week. Well, maybe the contrast is between the first term of any president and the, the second term, if he gets it, he or she gets it. Um, the, in the first term, there's a general tendency to assume that we, the sole remaining superpower, can change the world. After a while, it looks like some of the problems remain and they aren't subject just to a push or a nudge or a diktat uh, from Washington. Uh, I can remember George Schultz commenting to me at one point when he was Secretary of the Treasury, uh, they would reach a decision, he would reach a decision, it would pass down and it would be implemented. As Secretary of State, all too often, the decision would be made and it would bounce back up, not because of disloyalty or opposition within the department, but that the world didn't see it our way. Right. So we're still not seeing the world, in a sense, the right way. Are we misperceiving the situation here? Have we misperceived the situation and the first term and then and, and moving into the second? And what will be the perceptions, for example, of McCain and Obama? Well, there's going to be something of a repeat performance. Uh, there'll be a change, change in personnel, if not a change in party. And the, uh, the new fellows will feel, yeah, that mistake was made. I'm not going to repeat it. I'm going to be taking a fresh approach. Uh, we'll see. The world tends to wait uh, impatiently for us to get our new act in order, set the stage, and, and move out. Is that part of the, if you will, the, 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 the quietude is the fact that everybody, in a sense, is waiting on the American election? Well, definitely. Uh, people that we've uh, disagreed with in particular are maybe rethinking their positions or uh, sizing up the likely approach, trying to imagine what the likely approach of the new administration will be. 
and <clears throat> feeling if I make a concession now, it's uh, an amendment of my position now, what's the point? I've thrown, it, thrown that card away. Okay. Uh, those Americans will just pocket it and ask for so more. So we're really in a period in of a stasis until January, whatever it is, right. 20th, when the new president is sworn or in. At least or at least, at least after the election. After the election, yeah. Okay. Because the new team will be named very quickly by... Uh, whoever wins. Is there much likelihood that you will have a substantial change in the direction of American policy toward the region in general or to, toward specific entities, whether it's McCain or Obama? Or are there certain interests that impel certain actions irrespective of who's it, you know, in the Oval Office? Uh, the answer is mixed, yeah. Obviously, uh, the world doesn't change overnight just because we've had sure. an election and we want it to change. Right. I think that, I hope, that uh, whoever wins will not repeat what I think was a very bum mistake in approaching difficult problems by setting out on the table our preconditions. And I'm referring in this case to Iran to Syria as uh, two examples. <clears throat> Iran, you will you will uh, agree up front to stop your enrichment programs, and then we'll discuss uh, how we might uh, get together. And to a certain extent, that's preclusionary. That's like saying don't talk. Yeah. Well, that's the way they take it. Was it was it intent? Was that the intended message, or was that the way they took it mistakenly? I think that was the message from. An American side <clears throat> imbued with hubris, as they say, what we want, we can get. We just have to tighten the sanctions, increase the pressures, and they will cave. If you look at the two candidates, the, in a sense, the little that we know about what 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 they might do, and maybe they don't just certainly know either. Is the, is there a difference in approaches that would one make one of them more likely to do what you suggest? Well, it seems to be the uh, predisposition of uh, Barack Obama that uh, uh, he wouldn't be setting those preconditions. He's not going to rush in, as he said, to mm -hmm. sit with leaders who have uh, strongly opposed us. He'll work through diplomatic channels to get a sense of the meeting. Now, I think John McCain would find a new approach. I hope he would find a new approach if he is elected uh, to Iran, to Syria, to to the Iraq situation. But in terms of stated positions, it, it, it appeared to me at any rate that Obama was more likely to at least conceptually consider a different way to do it, and McCain was more, much more directly tied with the with the Bush policy. And I, yes, I agree with you, and I I think that uh, uh, that. That will send a signal, hey, to the others, uh, uh, these Americans are maybe more uh, ready to engage, more ready to, and from our point of view, our Iranian, our Syrian point of view, be serious. And, and in fact, if they are rational, they will give us incentives <clears throat> to behave that way. Yeah, that's always a dangerous assumption because right. they, they don't trust us, and, and we, we don't, don't trust, trust them. them. So, oh, yeah. I mean, if we start with that, I mean, clearly, that is that is the fundamental problem, both without with our allies, quote yeah. unquote, as well as our sure. enemies. Yeah. There are a lot of commentators out there, after reading through this stuff, making really positive predictions about the political situation in Iraq. It's far more rosy as I read through the materials from our various previous interviews. Is this a case of real wishful thinking here? Well, what is unreal wishful thinking? <clears throat> okay. I th uh, I think, yeah, I think there is such a hope that everything we invested, the blood, the treasure we've invested in Iraq, is going to be redeemed. And I think that's, that's one appeal that uh, Senator McCain has. I'm going to make the bet that you placed on being able to change Iraq uh, pay uh, quickly pay off. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, I, I promise you it's going to work. Uh, now, on Iraq, I'm afraid I, I do think there's a lot of wishful thinking uh, on both sides. Iraq is a tough nut to crack. And Iraq, when we went in, we were basically pretty ignorant about the conditions in the country. Uh, we tried to build up the knowledge and understand why 
X won't deal with Y because something his grandfather or his great grandfather did uh, politically in the in the past. Uh, there is a lot of grudges, and the the force, the speed of the American invasion upended a society that had been not an easy one, not uh, not all that tolerant to one of each other, but uh, had taken a certain set form under particularly under Saddam Hussein where he would use an iron fist very quickly against selected individuals or groups to liquidate them who opposed his uh, leadership. But uh, he let uh, the others, uh, the ordinary citizen, alone. Okay. And what, what, happened, what happened with our invasion was that, that rough period of anarchy that scared the daylights out of the Iraqis uh, in the months after the invasion. There was no real authority. And they've... Uh, and what authority there was, was the uh, temporary government under Paul Bremer who made a series of huge blunders. Well, <clears throat> yeah, the question of uh, dissolving the Iraqi army, they say uh, from Bremer's side that had been uh, uh, done, that had happened. There was no army to dissolve. But uh, that's a little too simplistic. There were a lot of men under arms who got no benefits, uh, were suddenly put out on the streets, but with their guns, and we've seen the result of that over the past several years. Now, the, the, part of this optimism is over the, the, the ethnic scene there. Has anything really changed? I mean, it seems to me you still have Sunnis versus Shia, and within the Shia themselves you have division yep. among and between groups, and then you've got the Kurds. So essentially, has that s situation changed? We're talking about centuries or, in fact, millennia of conflict here. Has it changed on the ground? It has changed on the ground in the sense that the, the power today is in the hands of the Shia in Baghdad. Now, that their writ does not extend unchallenged throughout the Sunni areas or much less the uh, in Kurdistan. But there are uh, temporary arrangements of convenience to uh, work out uh, a more peaceable relationship between uh, Sunni Arab, Shia Arab, and, and Kurds. But the fact remains we upended a society and Shia are now in control and they're going to fight like the devil to maintain that control. One of the, the reasons for the decrease in violence was the so-called awakening groups in Western Iraq, I guess the Sunni uh, portion of Iraq. But did we get tactical benefit from this by supporting them, arming them, etc., with cost in terms of long-range stability? Because aren't you arming the enemies of the, the sectarian leaders of the Iraqi government? Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> I want you, a longer you, you, one. You could put it uh, more politely. You're um, re-empowering uh, the Sunni to get back into the uh, uh, security scene and into the power uh, sharing scene. Mm -hmm. As I say, the, the Shia have taken control thanks to the great principle of one man, one vote, <clears throat> but the Sunnis haven't Well, I've heard, excuse reconciled. me, one man, one vote, one time, uh, sometimes. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, we've had three elections in okay. Iraq okay. Uh, okay. Uh, since the invasion, and they're coming up to provincial elections probably now in the first quarter of next year. It's, is that going to happen? Well, uh, <laughs> time will tell. It's, okay. it's hard to be... Uh, uh, prophet with a great okay. reputation okay. on things Iraqi, Go ahead. but the the fact is the Sunni uh, are feeling more confident. Uh, now, are they going to uh, use the arms that they have to fight against a Shia police, a Shia-led uh, military establishment, or are they going to find some way to reconcile, to recognize that uh, uh, <coughs> they? Uh, will do better negotiating from a position of strength for what they want in the political arrangements? And are the Shia going to be sensible and ready to, to bring them into 
the power sharing when uh, which they had cut themselves out of by boycotting the elections, what was it, is, two, or two or three years ago. Is that likely, again, I, I know you're not, don't, it'll don't be very, to be a prophet or a it'll, seer. It'll be very hard. Uh, the society is deeply roiled up now, and I don't personally see our, uh, the argument I don't accept the argument that our staying around is going to really heal those wounds. I think we risk being manipulated by one faction or another uh, for like forever, which we're not going to endure. But right. uh, the temptation to think that everything that's been achieved in terms of relative calm and relative loss of American lives and Iraqi lives can be um, uh, can be preserved if we only extend yet one more year or two years or three years. It, but it's a seem, close call. It, but it seems as if the Iraqi government, certainly the statements by the Iraqi government recently suggest that they want us out and they want us out in a relatively short period of time. The majority of troops are more, somewhat along the lines of the Obama suggestion. Whoever leads Iraq in the future is going to have to have established a reputation as being Iraq first out with the foreigners, out with the occupiers. That's that's an old theme in Iraq. Okay. And, uh, I mean, Which would I'm, apply to Iran, as we'll come to later uh, as well, I would presume. Well, we're not, yeah, we're not occupying uh, Iran. We are occupying Iraq. And, uh, you know, in, in favor of those are the arguments that we should stay to assure calm for a longer period. Uh, the, the question is, are we just accentuating this uh, this uh, playing playing the game that they want played of boosting the individual factions so we become a player on one side or another rather than quote unquote the umpire or a neutral arbiter it's very hard to be a neutral arbiter and it's very hard for anybody in power today to stay in power because they are quickly labeled the american stooge okay so if we stay, it's problematic because it doesn't, in a sense, force the Iraqis to make some really hard decisions that they might not otherwise make, and we might advantage some groups over others. But the other, the, the, the current scenario, I, I guess, is the, the doomsday scenario, that once the U.S. leaves, you have the Sunnis fighting the Shia, the Shia fighting themselves, the Turks, you know, holding off everybody, and perhaps some regional involvement. Again, is, is the doomsday scenario more or less likely than this, this forced reconciliation scenario? Well, put it this way, uh, the call between the arguments for withdrawal and, uh, and at an earlier date or for a later date are very close. It's a situation very close to call. And uh, anybody who asserts they can be sure how it'll go uh, two years from now, three years from now, I think is is frankly lying. Okay. We don't know. Okay. You've got this conflict in Iraq, and we've talked about this in the past. The, the, the dangers of the Iraq conflict spreading, regionalizing, is that the likelihood and what would be the, 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 the countries involved and what would be the triggers if such a thing were to happen? Well, all the neighbors have their wishes have to be analyzed, uh, and that's Syria, you know, Syria, Jordan, uh, uh, the Saudis, the Iranians, and the oh, Turks. Okay, uh, I think it's safe to say that no one of those wants to take over and run Iraq. All of those would like Iraq to uh, not be a threat to their countries. The Syrians get very uptight over the Kurdish situation. They've got a problem, which they don't generally acknowledge, in Syria with the Kurds in their, their country. Mm -hmm. We know the Turkish situation much better. They, their hostility to uh, independent Kurdistan and how that might uh, lead to a breakup of Turkey itself with further dissension with their Kurds. Uh, the Iranians, uh, they basically don't want to see a, an Iraq which is... Uh, uh, another uh, becoming a threat to Iran, as Saddam's Iraq was. So the, uh, what will be needed is to find a formula to bring those neighbors into effective negotiations with each other over Iraq. 
there are sessions of neighbors, there are meetings now in which we do take part, but my impression is there needs to be a lot more work in that forum just reminding everybody what their interests are and how they need to be reconciled, much less the interests of the parties within Iraq. Okay, let's let's look at Iran, one of one of those neighbors. Uh, again, there seems to be some kind of thawing, if you will, a little bit of relations between the United States and Iran. I mean, the the establishing of some kind of formal diplomatic ties, even though not at the, you know, the, the embassy level. What's happening U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, ever since the Iranian Revolution, that takes us back, uh, well, in, into certainly uh, 80, 1980. Uh, the embassy stayed open uh, till it was closed by the seizure right. uh, by the revolutionary mm -hmm. uh, student forces in those days. Um, we have been represented as a government by, I think it's from the beginning, by the Swiss. They, their embassy, there's been no American on the ground in Tehran, and it's possible, or there seems to be some move towards what's called an interest section, where we would have our people, whether within a Swiss embassy or some other power, or stand alone. An interest section generally means another power has uh, the overall relationship, and you're you're fitted into their mm -hmm. uh, their offices. Uh, this would be appealing to those Iranians who want to see a political improvement between Washington and Tehran. It's appealing to all Iranians who want to travel to the states. At the moment, it's a very cumbersome arrangement. They have to fly over to Dubai, have an interview, Dubai or Abu Dhabi in the Emirates, uh, go back, wait to hear if it's been approved, then return, pick up their visas. It's a sweat. Uh, so it would be uh, useful to the average Iranian, very and very welcome news. Um, and I think we would see it as the first step towards a more normal relationship. Also, the Iranians helped broker the peace in the battle in the south and led to al Sadr's backing down. So in a sense, there have been at least informal actions on the part of Iran communicating to the United States its intentions. I think that's true. And we, the administration's generally been unable to acknowledge any such things because although it's, we don't talk about the axis of evil so much anymore, uh, to credit Iran with any good intentions has just been something it's be evil. They very, yeah, well, they find it very hard to acknowledge. Okay, now, so you've got Iran as a growing regional power. What about the, their relationship with their neighbors? Are they becoming a power in so far as that they're, they're, they're creating a reaction? I mean, clearly the arms deal with the Saudis suggests that there is this, this tension between these nations as well, particularly the Saudis yes. and, and, and the Iranians for dominance in that region. That's correct. At, at one point historically, we talked about uh, depending on uh, as the leg, leg of a stool on the Iranians and the Saudis. That's when the Shah was still in charge. And uh, then the Shah was overthrown and that brought us, if anything, even closer in security uh, programs with the Saudis. They're very suspicious of the Iranians. They're suspicious of the Shia. I think the king in Saudi Arabia has made some overtures. There have been high-level visits back and forth. He's sponsored a couple of meetings uh, between, uh, in, the, in the name of interfaith meetings, uh, within Islamic circles between Shia and Sunni. Shia have been invited, much to the shock of some of the very conservative uh, clerics in Saudi Arabia. He uh, sponsored a meeting in Madrid, even even broader, with some rabbis there. So it's unusual for the Saudis. It's mm. still just a first step, maybe, but uh, it's a sign that uh, he he realizes there has to be some f form of reconciliation. But the bedrock suspicion remains between Shia and Sunni. Okay, let's let let me go back to a broader a broader question of that I mentioned in the lead, and that is oil. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen OPEC deciding not to increase its production, but the Saudis saying that we're going to stay at this high level of production. What what is what is the conflict there, and what is the likely outcome there? 
Well, I think the Saudis said that as a gesture to Washington. Uh, uh, you noted in the beginning that President Bush had been out there. He'd been out there twice since the first of the year, and oil was very much had to be part of the conversations he was having. Uh, the fact that they would maintain their recent levels of production uh, doesn't make much difference in the overall, in the world scene. The price is set by the world market, mm -hmm. not by the uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, barrels a day out of Saudi Arabia alone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the OPEC, the oil producing countries, uh, are concerned that with the economic slowdown, for reasons we know all too painfully uh, in uh, New York these days, uh, the drop in demand for oil, reflecting a slowdown in the uh, world e economic development, is going to be felt instantly in, in their countries. And this is, in most cases, this is their primary source of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they were, from their point of view, uh, being realistic when they talked about cutting back on production because the world isn't going to be absorbing it. Okay, last question. Uh November 5th, you get a call from the new president of the United States offering you the job of Secretary of State. What is the first thing you tell him when he asks you for your advice? Well, it'll be very late at night. I hope, well, I hope it doesn't happen. He's not going to wait. Yeah, he, you may okay. be up, but okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, well, he can't, he can't be specific, uh, country-specific uh, in the, those first days, in, in my opinion. He can lay out a uh, general set of principles about what will guide his administration, and they've been honing and crafting those words in the course of the campaign. Um, but uh, he can send us. Uh, he can send a signal in those very early days, even before he takes office, that. Uh, that we're going to make a fresh start. That's, that's traditional in our politics. I, uh, I don't think we'd be surprised at such a statement. And will it have been, meaning in the Middle East? I think it will have meaning out there because they have felt in either neglected or treated as uh, uh, total enemies, uh, and they may be, may, uh, they have every reason to hope uh, for what that means. They hope there will be a new approach from Washington. Well, we'll have to stop there on the, 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 the issue of hope, and we'll come back next week and see if hope is justified in another part of the Middle East, in Israel, Palestine, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. This has been part one of our conversation with Ambassador Richard Murphy. Next week, we'll continue our tour of the Middle East. Join us. I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.